I'm Robert Grant, and this is The Codex. What is philosophy? Well, if we break it down, it's actually two words, philo, or philo, and sophia. Philo just simply means lover, and sophia means wisdom. Philo Sophia is lover of wisdom. But philosophy was never intended to be something that was simply the study of rhetoric or of what other philosophers said and thought. Maybe that was an element of it. But in the ancient sense, philosophy was irrevocably tied to the concept of polymathy. A polymath, also in the ancient sense, poly simply means many, and math meant learning. Philosophy was not specifically an area of study. It was something that came as a result of studying many different things. And those things would be a mix of what is today referred to as the quadrivium. The quadrivium is referring to music, geometry, astronomy, and arithmetic. Today, we teach children that math is entirely separate from music, when actually it's not. We also teach our young people that art has nothing to do with science, when actually that is false. The way we're teaching our children in the world today is separating them out from their own things that they would like to pursue in their lives. I was a musician who had to give up music when I decided to become a responsible contributor to society. But if I could still be able to practice music and also recognize that it is the foundational form of geometry that informs all science and all matter and all energy in the entire universe, isn't that something that's important to know? We often think of our brain some sort of a hard drive for information. But what if we looked at this differently? What if we recognize that the brain is really just a radio receiver? And that in order for us to tune the receiver, our emotional state has a huge impact on that. In this analogy, we could say that the brain is a radio and the heart is the tuning dial. If we take this analogy even further, then maybe some certain things we need to do to be able to optimize our radio receivers and their tuning would actually benefit us. If we were a runner and we only exercise one half of our body, that would really cause a problem for having the balance required to be a very successful runner. The mental athlete and philosopher knows that they must have a balance of understanding to tune their minds and their brains to their optimal performance to receive universal consciousness. If we look through time, we'll notice that the people that seem to discover the most mathematics and physics throughout history, from Pythagoras and Plato to Socrates, in concepts not only relational to geometric forms, like the platonic solids, or musical ratios and intervals like Pythagoras discovered, but all the way up into including discrete mathematics, as well as physics. Isaac Newton discovered gravity, but Isaac Newton was also a musician. A lot of people don't know that he was a deep alchemist. In fact, 80% of his works were all centered around the concepts of alchemy and astrology. Isaac Newton believed that he was finding the signature of the Creator. He was a deeply spiritual man. And he realized that everything was connected, just like Johannes Kepler, who gave us the Kepler's laws of motion. He also was looking for this architect of the universe understanding as well the musical concepts 
in what he termed the harmony of the spheres. If we go to Rene Descartes, the famous philosopher who references, I think, therefore I am, also a mathematician. He's the person who gave us the Cartesian plane in mathematics. As we go through history, we start to realize that even mathematicians like Leonard Euler, Euler was an innovator not only in math, but across music, as was Bernard Riemann of the famed Riemann hypothesis, still an open problem in mathematics yet to be fully proven. He's also famous for neo-Riemannian music theory. It's interesting, isn't it? Because today we've broken up all of these different disciplines into their individual categories and never the twain shall meet, thus turning off our ability to receive from the universe. Ramanujan was a famous mathematician who was deeply spiritual also. He was never trained directly in mathematics. Yet Cambridge University, the same university from which we had Isaac Newton, declared Ramanujan one of the top mathematicians of all time. Yet Ramanujan claims that his discoveries mathematically were received from a great universal source. I fundamentally believe that as well. As one who has tapped into this higher consciousness from time to time, what I experience is actually that they all come out as equally balanced across science and art. When I'm drawing geometry, I'm not trying to draw an artistic form. Most of the time in my efforts, I'm actually trying to discover and understand a principle of the universe. And while I'm trying to depict it in a way that my mind can synthesize, it comes out in, in an artistic way. I believe that the future of humanity is to go deeply into this next stage of our evolution, to realize that our brains are not actually simply hard drives and storage units of information, but rather radio receivers with which to receive and understand the universal language of consciousness. I've said before, I don't really consider myself much of a mathematician because I don't want to be pigeonholed into my way of thinking. The old adage applies, if you're a hammer, then everything starts to look like a nail. What I noticed is that for me to get deeper into understanding of mathematics, often it is through the doorway and portal of music or art or philosophy that I'm able to tap into a higher understanding of the underlying math and language behind the concepts I'm trying to understand further. We've all seen the very famous Sistine Chapel in the fresco in the ceiling. And I remember going there for the very first time and just being awestruck at the beauty of Michelangelo's artwork on that Sistine Chapel ceiling. We've all seen also Adam outreaching to God in this representation. But I remember the first time I went there, I started to ask myself the question, what is it that's around God in the painting? Could it possibly be the cross-section of a human brain? And as you get deeper into that analysis, you'll notice that the cerebellum is prominently displayed on the right side. You can also see all of the different aspects of the prefrontal cortex, the temporal lobe, all of it being displayed simply in this artistic form that he left on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. Even God the Father in this famous iconic image has his leg shaped in a mirrored imagery of Adam's right leg, just as the fingers outreaching to each other are mirror images of the same concept. What's Michelangelo trying to tell us? Is he trying to tell us something 
about the nature of the universe and the U inverse. We also notice that God the Father's head is in the prefrontal cortex where the brain has its highest degree of higher order thought and creativity. But what if the only means to tap into this and move beyond this reptilian brain of fight or flight is to balance the muscle? The mental athlete will know that he or she must be balanced above all else. And that balance can only be achieved intellectually by having an understanding of music and its equal mirrored opposite across the corpus callosum, mathematics. Math and music are simply representations of two opposite sides of our brain. But that's also true as well for visual art, which we have near our occipital lobe at the back of the brain. And its mirrored opposite representation, in this context, is the natural sciences. So we can now see the brain as a different kind of receiver that ultimately is intended to ignite and activate the center right amid the corpus callosum, the connective tissue that allows us to both think and feel simultaneously. As we can balance our brain muscle through our study of the quadrivium, then we can actually activate the pineal and pituitary glands. And when we do so, it forms a Merkaba. That Merkaba allows us to access different fields of awareness that are above and beyond our third and fourth dimensional planes of understanding. The philosophers knew this. And yet, it was something that could be very dangerous during their lifetimes. Because as they got to this point of higher knowledge and ascension, their lives were at risk. And this has been seen over and over and over again throughout history. The good news for us today is we're now living in a different time. The earth is intended now through this aeon, this portion of our procession of equinox, and this age of Aquarius is intended for us to be able to seek and not only seek, but also experience this level of higher awareness. That what the philosophers experienced and all the myriad discoveries that they had in their renaissances throughout time will now be coming again to this earth. Carl Jung was a very famous psychologist and psychiatrist. Carl had been a protege of Sigmund Freud, but he realized the limitations of Sigmund Freud's philosophical perspective on psychiatry. And he noticed that most of the concepts of Freud were rooted in these very arcane approaches and, and belief that mankind was literally chained to the lower segments of the Maslow's hierarchy of needs. But Carl Jung believed a different future for humanity as a philosophical, wisdom-seeking alchemist. Carl Jung noted that there was a divine future for humanity. He called this process individuation in a book that he wrote called Aeon. This individuation process is something that is achieved through balanced thought and study resulting in philosophy. What Carl Jung believed is that as we ascend to higher knowledge through learning to balance our brain centers across the quadrivium, that we will be able to experience new higher dimensional experiences, provided however that we learn how to integrate our shadows. If we live in a you inverse, every experience you have is your responsibility. My experiences are my responsibility. Fear could be real. 
from the perspective of danger. Danger is real, but fear actually is a choice. How we interact and deal with the deck of cards that we are dealt on a day-to-day -day basis is what defines our reality, not the deck of cards that we're given. Every moment that we experience can either be the best or the worst. The choice is up to us. How we decide to perceive the world defines our ultimate experience with it. And Carl Jung understood this. And he taught this in the concepts of shadow integration.